You're listening to a podcast of Relatively Speaking on MPB Think Radio. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Good morning. This is Relatively Speaking, the show all about you and your family. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Well, job number one for parents is to end up with children who grow up to be happy, healthy, and self-sustaining adults. That's right. To achieve that, some amount of support and hovering is necessary. You know, we've talked about helicopter parents. And so a little bit of helicoptering is probably needed because you can't just let your child be a free-range child and let them figure life out altogether by themselves, right? Um, I know some of you out there maybe had parents who were so disconnected and so uninvolved that there wasn't enough supervision, perhaps not enough caring around you. So some of that is necessary. But how much is too much? So, listeners, my question to you is, have you found the balance? Did you, as you were raising your children, did you have overbearing parents? Or were you that free-range child that maybe is not so good? Sometimes it turns out fine, but most of us need a little bit of supervision, right? And a little bit of rule to follow. So today, I really do want to talk about how much hovering is too much and why control, control and support are completely two different things. Control is something where you are not allowed to make the decisions. Control is where you are told what to do, how to dress, how to act, where to go. But supervision and support are helping you learn how to do, where to go, and where to, how to act, right? So um, as we step through the show, I, I really would love to hear any examples that you may have in your own life of, of how maybe there was a little too much helicoptering and, and perhaps you weren't allowed to figure some things out for yourself because we know that that can be damaging or smothering. So... There's nothing wrong with wanting to take care of your children. There is nothing wrong with wanting them to stay safe and healthy and be successful and do the right thing. But you've got to have a healthy balance, so to speak. And that healthy balance um, allows some mistakes. And it allows also for children to deal with consequences. It also allows children to figure out that sometimes their actions are going to end up with consequences that they may not like. So sometimes you'll have parents who let too much of that go. But sometimes you have parents who protect a child so much that they never allow them to have any secondary consequences to their actions. And they never allow them to take the blame for any of their actions. I'm sure you know some people out there who parent that way. Um, <laughs> and so... Um, as we're moving along, I'd love to hear some examples. I'll have some for you, and Michelle may have an example here or there also. Good morning, Michelle. Thanks for being with me today again. Of course. Good morning. How is everybody today on this beautiful Tuesday? Uh, Easter week weekend just passed, and uh, how was your Easter? 
Oh, man, was filled with lots of family. We had 33 at my house on wow. Easter Sunday. Oh, my God, that was um, fun, though, I'm and sure. And my little grandkids, and I enjoyed them so much. We had an indoor Easter egg hunt, which was not quite as much fun. Because it, it was wet fun. outside. Yeah, yeah, it was wet outside. We got a significant amount of rain in Kent. Yeah, we yeah. It, it, it rained a lot on Saturday and Sunday. My daughter's prom was Saturday, and uh, senior prom, and... Um, hence the show topic, um, letting go. We have a lot of parents whose children are about to graduate high school and go to college. Yes. A lot of parents or kids are going to graduate college and move on or move away to another city or state, possibly country. And I want to hear from our listeners. Um, how did you handle that transition? How did you handle that change of letting go? How did you let go? I need advice. <laughs> um, <laughs> If you had trouble letting go, let me know. Let's talk about that. If you did it and you had some tips for other parents that are letting go now, uh, let us let me let's talk about them. Uh, if you had overbearing parents when you were young, I want to hear that too. How did you deal with that? And if you're an adult and you still have overbearing parents, I want to hear <laughs> your stories, right? Because it still happens. That certainly still happens, mm-hmm. and especially around holidays, sometimes oh, yeah. um, overbearing parents or weddings or weddings Weddings over yeah (laughs) will continue to impart the rules and regs that they think need to be there and continue to have expectations on their adult children that maybe are not appropriate expectations and so i think as we go through the show i i'd like to hear about that too and i'd like to hear about how you As an adult, if you do continue to have parents who are trying to impart rules or tradition that you know needs to change, need to change, then how did how did you do that? What did you do? And I'll give you a little bit of advice at the end as we are talking through this, or if you have some specific questions about what to do, please call. Um, we have open lines, one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Or you can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. Well, Dr. Butchers, how were your parents when it comes to... Um as far as being strict or if you say overbearing, mm-hmm. were they uh, neutral Which, in your perspective? You in know? my perspective, I had, uh, we've talked about this on the show, I had um, very protective parents. Uh, we lived in a, a small town that was relatively safe growing up, but we were, I'll just go ahead and put it out there, we were Lebanese Catholic in a not Lebanese Catholic town, so we were a little bit different, and so I think um, our parent. I think our parents were a little protective, just making sure that we were were treated well and kindly, and and I always felt like we were. So they also were pretty strict about. Um, curfew and who we could go with and the like, Um, but not about as far as a real helicopter controlling, you know, we basically wore what we we wanted to wear within the regulations of we wore the makeup. We were never really told those kinds of things that we could or could not do. They never told us who could or could not be our friends. They never um, had that kind. So in the, of course, I grew up back in the 60s. And so it was such a different time when, um, you know, it was it was probably safer. We mm-hmm. could be outside mm-hmm. until it was too dark to see. And you, you brought know. up a good point. Um, just say your generation, and my daughter is 18 now, so she was born in 2003. Uh, social media, Instagram came about and things like that. Do you think it's safe to say that parents now have, of course, different um, things to think about that you got your parents did not have to think about, and do we have to be more strict now or is it 
like you said, free range. I've never heard that word <laughs> used with the children. And I laughed when you said it. Free range, meaning, of course, not letting your children do everything they want to. But at what age, and I'm asking the audience, too, what age do you start giving your child more leeway and more responsibility and what age do you stop telling them basically what to do and okay i'm going to stop you there because there is not an age there is not a marker what it's supposed to be is something gradual Mm -hmm. so that even with very young children you can start giving them some responsibilities and allowing them to make their decisions i always get very concerned about parents who lay out clothes uh, for children and will not allow them to wear what they want because that that is one of those areas you know within reason that that you can allow a child at a very young age to start learning how to be creative Mm -hmm. how to make their own decisions Mm -hmm. how to be able to um, figure out what is appropriate and what is not it's the same that goes as as far as you know even simple things like um what sports they want to participate in as a young child or what type of picture i have watched parents sometimes as a child is drawing a picture correct, correct them yeah um that so at a very young age it's mm-hmm. important to start allowing a child to make their own decisions and feel confident that there there's not a wrong decision on certain things. Mm. And then the time you have to helicopter in a little bit is when there are things that could be harmful, dangerous, or if they're doing something that is mean, hateful, aggressive, or unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And so I think drawing those lines is is really important. And I'd love to hear from from our listeners as they were parented or perhaps as they did parent. Um, When did you how did how did you draw the lines, still maintain some control, but still allow for that creativity and and let a child learn how that they could be independent? That's the hardest thing in the I'm just listening to it. And, you know, sounds so nice on paper. But doing, it's hard. Yes, my God. And you you did it three times? Three? How many five. times? Five. Oh, my God. <laughs> and that's five, five different personalities. It five. is five different personalities. And every child is a little bit different. But they all need to be fostered somewhat in the same way in, in allowing them that decision-making process. So... I know we need to go to our first break. Um, Give us a call, listeners. I want to hear your thoughts about this. 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. We're talking about having um, supervision, but not being an overbearing, controlling parent. A little helicoptering is good, we have found. And I'll talk to you about a study that showed exactly what the best amount, some not exactly, but an overall view of what the right amount is. So this is Relatively Speaking. We'll be right back. Hi. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. Parents are a child's first teacher. Children make connections to the growing world around them through back and forth interactions. Parents and other caregivers can help children learn communication and social emotional skills by talking, reading, and singing each day. More information at MississippiThrive.com. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. Today we're talking about overbearing, controlling parents versus free-range parents who don't don't give enough supervision what were you um, as a parent or what are you and what did you grow up with 
Do you think it affected you? Do you think it caused any issues that you may have? You can give us a call at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's 877-672-7464. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. But we are going to go on to the phones. We have Donna and Meridian. Hi, Donna. How are you this morning? Doing great. Thanks for calling. I'd love to hear I'm your sorry. thoughts. Well, uh, you said something that kind of triggered a memory for me. I'm, I'm probably closer to your generation. I have two daughters now who are in their early 40s, and they mm-hmm. have among them three little grandsons. My husband was a minister, so, of course, our children were raised in the church, and they were taught, you know, all of that, all that goes along with that as they were growing up. We tried very hard not to force them to, you know, to fit into the preacher's kid mold and that kind of thing, but we did expect them to, you know, to be mannerly and polite and respectful and, you know, follow our our own home rules and that kind of thing. And when our girls got to be 13 or 14 years old, we sat them down and we had a talk with them, and we basically said to them, you know, we're proud of you. We think you're great kids. We know that you understand how you've been raised and what our family rules and code of conduct are. And now you are teenagers. And we, I know this sounds crazy, but it worked for us. (laughs) And we we said, now you are teenagers, and we are about to give you a lot more freedom. You still have to tell us what you want to do and where you're going and who you're going to be with. But for the most part, unless we have a good reason, we're going to tell you, yes, that you can do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You just need to understand that if we ever find out that you are breaking family rules and doing things that you know that are against our rules, and that meant things like drinking, smoking, you know, things mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. we, um, we, will, we will pull back mm-hmm. your privileges. Mm-hmm. And I can still remember their faces. First, they were just stunned. Yeah, <laughs> they were I bet. So surprised that we were giving them that, but also I could see on their faces, oh, don't worry, I'm not going to lose this. If you really come through with this, I'm not going to do this. And they were absolutely delightful teenagers. We had the best uh, that was our favorite time of raising them, and we had we had all kinds of agreements. You know, we told them, if you're ever in a situation that makes you uncomfortable and you feel unsafe, all you have to do is pick, all you have to do is give us a sign and say, I don't want to do this, Mom. Mm-hmm. You know, if somebody mm-hmm. calls and invites you, and we would take on the phone and say, no. I need you here for this or that, you know, Mm -hmm. and we would kind of take on the bad guy role for them. And they did that from time to time. We told them, if you're ever out, you're in a bad spot. All you have to do is call and say, come get me, mom, and we'll come. We will not give you a hard time. We will just come and get you. And we'll talk about it later. But we gave them a, a great deal of freedom within the boundaries you know, of what they had been raised, Mm -hmm. and they went off to college, both of them, 500 miles away, and they did extraordinarily well. They, they adjusted very well, and, uh, and both of them live far away today, which I know is not what Mississippi parents want, but, you know, we, we believed in, I always believed that if you want your children to come home, you got to hold them with an open hand. And let them know that they have the freedom to fr- to fly. Right, and that Beautiful. was just our that was how we did things. Beautiful. Um, I I think that is all so very perfect. I have a, a question for you, Donna. So yes. before they were thirteen, fourteen, did tell me how much leeway they had then because I suspect that that they had s- some hovering but not not a ton were you allowing them to make Absolutely. some independent decisions 
we did, but very, mm-hmm. uh, very, you know, very cautiously. When mm-hmm. I mean, we, we, I was basically a stay-at-home mom, mm-hmm. and you know, we had routines during the day. They were given, they had chores to do from a fairly young age. Mm-hmm. You know, we had. I was very careful about who they played with. You know, I kind of was careful about you know the families that they were with. That their their lives revolved mm-hmm. around the church and around school they knew they knew very very well that if they got in trouble at school that i was going to check it out and if they were if they if they were in the wrong they were going to be held responsible for being in the wrong perfect and if they were if they were right that i was going to be the mother bear and be in their slugging for them <laughs> only one time did i ever have to do that with either one of them only one time did i ever go to the school saying my child has been wronged, mm-hmm. but you know. Other than that, but they they knew that you know that we had rules, and I was a strict mom. I was, mm-hmm. you know. I they were they were taught to have manners, to get along with with people, to respect adults, to respect authority, to follow the rules at school, to follow the rules of the church, and all that. But yet within that too, you know, they had quite a lot of freedom to play with the children in the neighborhood and to come and to go and, you know, playing with friends and going to, to friends' houses and all that. But there was a time or two along the way that they went home with other children, spent the night maybe up in junior high and or older elementary, and they were shown movies that were inappropriate. One one of my daughters had nightmares for two three weeks after mm-hmm. her, yeah after it's been the night party and when I got to the bottom of it and found out that she was eleven and the mother had allowed them to watch one of those Hannibal Lecter movies Ooh. I I put a stop to that they yeah. just, she didn't go over there anymore to spend the night you know we had yeah there are controls that you have to exercise to be yeah. able to to help your children navigate through life. So yeah. I, yeah. honestly, Donna, it just sounds like you you and your husband did a, a wonderful job. I'll ask you one last question. Do you think your okay. daughters will raise their children in the same manner? You know, I, it's, they have boys. I had girls. Uh-huh. And they... They are very much, they have, they're, they're not as strict and stern with their children as I was with them because I was raised very strictly and very mm-hmm. sternly mm-hmm. my parents from the Depression. You know, they are, they're more gentle and they're more kind, you know, and whereas I would have, I would have been more free to swat them on the hind end if they weren't obeying, my children will sit there and say, Judah, Judah. <laughs> I want you to obey me. You know, we're getting the same result. And so I, I really I have so many friends, women friends my age, who have tensions with their adult children, mm-hmm. especially their adult daughters. And I certainly experienced that with my own mom. And I have tried very hard to be a support and an encourager and an interested audience of my girls but they're the grown-ups they're the moms and i'm not and 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 interestingly the less advice i offer the more they come to me asking for money yeah 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 so because they value the way you that you raise them so I think um, they do. Yeah. I think they do. Well, Donna, I think it sounds like you've done a, a beautiful job. And and I think that um, I bet your girls are going to do the same. I want to throw a, a question out to the listening audience. Do you think there should be different standards for boys and girls as far as helicopter or controlling? As we're talking through this, Donna, you brought that up. So um, again, thank you. Um, Great model of what to do. I do think that you probably spent a lot of time in those first 13 years to be able to have such a success at the in the yeah. the high school years. So congratulations yeah, think, on that. So. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Well, thanks for your call. And listeners, I'd love to hear um, 
other examples, other uh, or your response to um, Donna and and her pattern. Do you think you could do that? Um, I will say that we did. I did as a parent um, work hard to try to expand uh, privileges and and let go. Uh, as we were moving along and certainly toward the end of high school, if we hadn't already made everything, instilled the values and all in our children by the end of high school, we, we, my husband and I talked about it. If you're not done by then, if you're still struggling to instill values by 16 or 17, you're waiting too late. So, okay, we're talking about helicopter controlling and support as parents. Give us a call, 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. We will be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress with a Mindful Minute. Children grow up so fast, before you know it, they'll be starting kindergarten. A good way to watch for school readiness is to mark developmental milestones like talking in sentences, counting, writing, and playing well with others. Positive adult-child relationships are key to helping children meet these milestones. You already have the tools you need. Talking, singing, and reading are fun ways to help children learn and thrive. One way to celebrate these special moments is to use a milestone checklist. Healthcare providers are also a great resource to help make sure your child's on the mark and ready for the next step. Examples of developmental milestones, fun family activities, and additional resources can be found at MississippiThrive.com. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking. We're talking about helicopter parents versus control versus support. And how, how do you find the balance? And when do you start letting go? Well, it should be a gradual thing. We know that. We also know that a certain amount of supervision is, is really necessary to be able to find out how to live and what are the rules of life and how to treat other people and the like. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about a research study that was done by a group of researchers who who really looked at um, three different kinds of helicopter parents, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, a little bit is good. So what they did is, um, you know, after all the sensationalization of helicopter parents talking about it in the media and saying that it's all bad, um, they decided to look at um, 500 different families And they started identifying children when they were 11. And it was a 10-year study. And they followed these kids out until they were in their 20s. And what they looked at is how much support and control was there. And what what they found in in a nutshell was that there was one small group, about 3% of those 500 families, were generally uninvolved and in all the categories, supporting, controlling, and helicoptering. They just were not, they were like kind of free-range parents, as I put it. There was a mid-sized group that was controlling with some helicoptering, but very controlling, so they made the decisions for their children. That was about 15 to 20 percent. The larger group was uh, 50 to 70 percent. They were supporting, not controlling, with some helicoptering, Um, so supervision, okay? And what they found 
um, that these emerging adults, when they got to be in their early 20s, um, if they had parents who were supportive but still a helicoptering a little bit, had the most positive outcomes. So, again, support is not control. Control is not allowing your children to make decisions. Support is being there to help them with their decision-making and then bolstering them if a problem comes up, okay? But not, not, not taking over and certainly not... Um, trying to diminish consequences of poor decision-making, but to allow them to have to have those consequences. Okay. Well, let's go back to the phones. We have first Sue in Beaumont. Hey, Sue. Hey, how you doing? Good. Well, you're talking about helicopter parents, and um, I had more of an Army tank sort of <laughs> You did what you were told, and you got a whooping. Uh, now, nowadays, you, you do that. You, you're accused of child abuse, you know. But uh, I, I think sometimes a swaddle behind or a switch on your behind is not going to hurt a child. And they remember that, you know. Well, Sue, so when did your parents? Now, certainly, I think. Hopefully, all parents are doing quite a bit of supervising and supporting in a young child. When did your parents start letting up a little bit and allowing you to have some effect on decision making and making? Whenever you got old enough to leave home and get away from their influence. Oh, oh, so not until then. Do you think it affected you at all as far as being able to make decisions later as an adult? One, one of my sisters put it this way. It's a wonder any of us grew up able, I mean, as stable, sane, as stable, sane adults after the childhood we had because, see, their, their parents didn't show them how to parent. Uh-huh. And uh, so they didn't show us how to parent. Uh-huh. We were just uh, like little wild critters there, but if you misbehaved, you got a whooping. Yeah. Yeah, is, and is it against the law to give a child a spanking any now nowadays or what? No, no, it's not against the law to give a child a spanking. It's against the law to commit abuse. Um, it is against the law to leave marks on a child. And I know a lot of uh, back in the history, there were many parents who spanked and left, you know, red lashes and the like on them. So we know that's not good, and it really doesn't serve. Uh, a child well. I think, you know, discipline can happen without spanking, but um, it's one of those things um, that I think sometimes people, especially in the South, often believe that you have to have to use it. Whatever the case, I think, um, you know, I know there's some supportive helicopter parents who may have also used some spanking. Um, but what you want to avoid is is having that. <laughs> so uh, it sounds like, I've, you know, you call frequently and I love hearing from you and you always have good thoughts. And even though you had very controlling parents, you must have been one of those resilient individuals who was able to navigate through. Um, but by and large, research shows that too much control increases anxiety, increases depression, and makes for an individual who has difficulty in life with decision making and being a leader, so to speak. So anyway, well, thanks for calling. As always, I always enjoy your calls. Um, let's stay on the phone. Uh, we have uh, Jane from Brandon. Hi, Jane. Hello there. Hi. Tell us what your thoughts are today, or question. <laughs> well, I have sort of um, something unusual. I don't know. And my, I, we have two sons, and they're both in their 40s now, and we have a very good relationship with those boys. But my philosophy was say yes to everything. Uh, <laughs> I rarely, <laughs> rarely said no. When we did say no, it meant something. Uh-huh. Um, in fact, I started weaning them and make, having them make their own decisions when they were like two years old. 
um, for example, when crossing the street, I'd always ask them, when should I cross? And let them determine the danger there. Um, and when we went to the doctor, they filled out all the paperwork. I never filled anything out. Wow. Um, <laughs> so I was trying all along to get them independent, good decision makers. Um, I didn't. I didn't work, so I, I had time to spend with these boys. But whatever they wanted to do, I said yes. Let's do it. And uh, there was rarely a no. And to this day, they always say, "Say yes." That's what. <laughs> that's what kept everybody together. So I had more fun saying yes than no, and I got to play with them, and we kind of grew up together. And now the, my husband. He was uh, more of the kind of authority figure to them, so they they knew they couldn't just do bad things. Mm. They knew consequences to that. But with me, it was all play. Um, and it still is, and they know it. So. That's really, yeah, that's really interesting. Do they, are they as attached to their father as they are to you? Um, love him to pieces and make fun of all his crazy ways as they were growing up and me. They are unmerciless teasing us because of the way they grew up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like a happy childhood. Okay, let me ask you this. You said there were there were a few no's. Can you give an example of them wanting to do something and you saying no emphatically? Um, anything that was super-duper dangerous, mm-hmm. yeah. I would let them do dangerous things. But if I could see uh, a fatality involved, I would <laughs> and when I said no, they accepted that. Um, I mean, I had them, they did everything. And um, my husband now, he was, he, he was like, you're, you know, you know how to behave. And they, they knew where they stood uh, as far as behavior. Yeah. So they never really gave us any problems. Um, with bad behavior they were mischievous and in fact one of my boys wanted to roll the neighbor's house and i said well okay go ahead i said but if you get caught you know you're gonna have to clean up all that mess so uh, i don't i don't even i think i went with him and we both rolled the house <laughs> uh, wow okay you sound you you sound like a lot of fun um, I guess the the main thing that I would want to say is, and I know you did this, as a parent, you know, it's your responsibility to be protective and the like. Did did Do you feel like that your sons grew up to be respectful adults and caring about others? Absolutely. Um, absolutely, yes. They went yeah. they to college. They both got degrees. They made all their own decisions. They didn't overspend money. They didn't go party. I mean, they had fun. They played sports. They did everything. But as long as this mom here said yes, they never had. I think the the key is the balance because you also had a husband who um, was perhaps one who was a, a rule keeper and making sure that they felt like they were in line. But I bet you did, too. You can do that in a loving way and an accepting way um, without, you know, I think. Sometimes parents forget that just talking through things sometimes is a good technique. For example, if they ask to do something that would be somewhat dangerous or something that you just flat out didn't approve of, instead of saying an emphatic no, what about let's talk about this? Are you concerned that this could happen? Could this possibly happen? I think that those kinds of discussions are learning discussions. I'm sure there's some people out there who are going to disagree with <laughs> saying yes all the time. Um, and, but I, I can see that this technique would work as long as you talk through the decision-making process and because that could be such a learning opportunity, a teaching opportunity for your children to learn right. so well you know sometimes they would ask me what do you think about this mm-hmm. and i would say well you make good decisions make a decision in other words 
you know, I let I guided them to think on them for themselves, and it paid off. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, Dad was there to make sure that they were respectful in the community and they didn't run hooligans. Right. Uh, so, but you know, I it, it just worked for us. Yeah. To be a happy mom. Yeah. I just, That's I just, wonderful. Yeah, and we just played all the time. That's so, fabulous. <laughs> Well, you sound like a happy person. So, Jane, thanks for calling and telling your story. Another technique, guys. I think, you know. (laughs) All right. Have a good rest of the day. Oh, well, let's stay on the phone. Um, I'm loving hearing the different techniques of what parents have done. We're going to go to Kay in Poplarville now. Hi, Kay. Hi, I want to thank you for taking my call. I spent this past weekend with my grandchildren, ages two and five, Mm -hmm. and they are so special to me. And my daughter-in-law, in a form of trying to get them to cooperate when they weren't, would say things like, if you don't do it, grandma's not going to read to you. If you don't do it, the Easter Bunny's not going to come. My observation with that behavior is they have learned that their mother doesn't mean what she's saying Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I'm going to read to them and Easter Bunny's going to come. And I wondered how I can deal effectively with it. I don't want to challenge her parenting in front of her, but on the other hand, I didn't like being a scapegoat, and I think that what she's done is reinforced that, oh, she said this, but she really doesn't mean it. And the kids can be very, they misbehave a lot. Mm. Ooh, you're you're bringing up one of my favorite topics, actually, because, uh (laughs) well, Kate, the truth is that there are some very basic behavioral rules that everyone should follow. And I will say that one of my favorite social workers of all times, Lori Neff, and I... um, sort of have a compilation together I and I, I use some of her rules and then I added to it and it's called Dr. B's Parenting Rules and one of the top on the list, in, in fact I'll put these on our um, website oh, that'd be podcast we'll, we'll put them on the podcast also where you can link Michelle's laughing at me because I always say it wrong but one one of the first and foremost rules is say what you mean and mean what you say. So if you if you say that a child is to do something, just say it again. And then if they don't, make sure you're clear about the instruction. Make sure they understand, but I am with you. Threats are of no consequence at all unless you follow through. And if you follow through, that's fine. But typically, it's better in general behavioral management to put things in more of a positive light. Um, Instead of saying, if you don't do this, grandma won't read to you, then you say, Let's get this done, and then Grandma can read to you. Two different, yes, two yes. different yes. ways to put <laughs> put it in the light, right? Um, and mm-hmm. it typically gets done. Um, yeah. And so you're right, and I'm happy we will have that available. Um, okay, and and I would encourage you to to. Let your daughter daughter in law listen to this. I know so many times it's it's a little bit difficult, and the honest truth is, as someone mentioned on an earlier call, um, we parent the way we were parented, unless somebody teaches us differently, and yeah. unless someone is making a conscious effort to do it differently and learn. Right. Michelle, I think, has a comment. I wanted to say or it's a drastic difference, meaning the opposite. Unless you go the opposite way. Right. My parent, my parents were strict. Uh, My father was real strict, extra strict, I would say. And I believe 
that's one of the reasons why I was not as strict with my daughter. Mm -hmm. She's uh, about to be 19 this year, and I kind of raised her where we did a lot of conversating. Mm-hmm. conversations. We I talked about a lot of different things right. and wanted to know her opinion. And at a young age, my dad pulled me aside and said, do you think that's wise? He always leads with that <laughs> when he's going <laughs> to tell me what he thinks, but he always leads with, do you think that's wise giving Jordan mm-hmm. that much uh, leeway and that much freedom or you guys talk about everything. Shouldn't she just do what you say to do? And I told him at a young age, I did not want my daughter to grow up doing what I said just because I said it. I wanted her to understand why she was doing this or that and make a better decision. And he asked me at four or two or three, do you think she has the capacity to uh, understand the re- or reason, uh, the reasoning. And that's a question for Dr. Butchers. Do you think at an early age, children, you should teach them because I said so, or here's why you should do this versus that? Yeah, I think always it's good to help your child learn reasoning through. Always good. Um, Occasionally, you know, if a child's pushing back over and over and you're done with your explanations, I think it's fine to end it with because I said so. That is okay. But but certainly to be able to step through why something perhaps is better this way than that way. But to present choices is is always good and to allow them to help to try to reason through is is important. So so Kay, I'm glad you brought this up. It it really is important if you're trying to shape a child into that successful, loving, caring adult that we all want who can sustain themselves and make their own decisions. I hope that's what we all want. Because if you want a <laughs> yeah. child to stay dependent on you, then that is um that is some pathology, actually, if you want an adult child to stay dependent on you. And um, that that's another whole issue. But yeah, uh, that's another, another show, another show. But to but to be able to um, shape a child into a good decision making adult, it's it's a good idea to to have rules and regs. To say yes every time you can, um, say yeah. Say say no when when you really need to, and I think no with an explanation is good because it helps them learn that learn that why you're saying that. It helps them understand that there are reasons, and then I also just as we're talking about consequences, if you're gonna raise a child who understands consequences back to your your point k um if whether it's a threat from you or a consequence a negative consequence from something they've done if you don't make sure that they suffer those consequences because of their actions then they're never going to learn. Um, yeah. And these boys cry at the drop of a hat when they said no to. Mm. They've uh, learned that that's all they've got to do. Well, and again, <laughs> yet another mistake because, um, again, that's another one of those rules of discipline. No means no. If you say mm-hmm. no and then yeah. someone cries or stomps or tantrums, I, Adults do that, right? If some, if 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 somebody said no to me, and then I um, was sad and begged, and then they turned around and said yes, what would you do the next time they said no to something you wanted? I wouldn't believe them. Right, you You would would do the same thing. Do the same same thing thing again. You'd cry. Well, hopefully not fall on the floor and tantrum as an adult, but but you would you would do something if you knew it worked before. It's you would keep. I it's, mean, called, it's, it's called conditioning. It's called conditioning. Yeah. yeah. And so, so my question is, how do I treat my daughter-in-law? How do I how do I how do I 
get her to understand that I don't want to interfere. I don't want to be the scapegoat, and I don't think it's an effective learning techniques for the kids. Yes. And not and not have her just say, oh, that's the mother-in-law. Well, perhaps one thing that you could do is say something like, if she says, if you don't do this, grandmama's not going to read to you. You can say, oh, yes, grandmama's going to read to you, but the best thing to do is to do this first. Get this done. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> And I, and I have actually done that before, and I have had parents threaten their child, if you don't do this for Dr. Buttress, she'll give you a shot. And I always say, oh, no, I will not give you a shot, but I would really appreciate it if you'd let me listen to your heart, you know, or look in your ears. So, Kay, thanks. We can do another whole show on these. We've got to go now, but thanks so much for calling, and I'd love to hear a follow-up. All right. Thank you so much, and Michelle, too. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to all our listeners and callers. If you'd like to hear this show again or any past episodes, you can listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast app by searching Southern Remedy Relatively Speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio, engineered by Michelle McAdoo. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I will hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking and that you'll stay tuned for NPR's here and now, coming up next right here on MPB Think Radio.